Hello, how's it going everybody? Good, good. Woo. It's great to be back here in Antwerp, fantastic. I'm Richard. And I'm Raoul. Yeah, so Raoul, I heard that it was like a, a big year this year, like an anniversary or something. Yeah, there was some delicious cake downstairs. So it's J Java's birthday, Java's anniversary, 20 years. 20 years of Java, fantastic. Exciting, woo! woo. Right. All right. So let's all together, on the count of three, say happy birthday, Java. Okay? Three, three two, two, one. one. Happy, happy birthday, birthday Java. Java. Fantastic, fantastic. That's not, that's not fantastic, though. I think we can do louder than that, right? We can do better than that, can't we? Yeah, yeah? Okay. Three, two, one. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Java. Java. Fantastic. That's a bit better. Is it? Okay. I'm people, claiming it's better. People need a bit of beers, I think, before they <laughs> shout a bit louder. <laughs> cool, cool. So uh, we're here to talk a little bit about generics for the next hour or so. And a lot of people, when they see generics, kind of see a situation that's a little bit like this, right? It's like there's something that's kind of complicated going on on their screen, but it's not really very obvious. Not really very obvious what's going on here. Richard, what are you doing on this picture? What are you looking at the pavement? That's, that's what the roads are like in the UK. This is, <laughs> this is the result of austerity. That's what, that's what happens with the roads. Right, but the point is that we want to kind of enlighten you a little bit and look at some of these features, look at some of the things we have in Java, which are already available today, which you can use, but aren't necessarily used so much. And then, as the talk goes on, we'll also have a little kind of brief crystal ball gazing and see about some of the upcoming features that might also impact generics and change generics in the future as well. So that'll be quite exciting. But first, let's go way, way, way back into the past. Does anyone remember 2004? Yeah, I hope everyone's hand should be up here. You are hopefully all over 11 years old. And there was this website, right, called The Facebook. Do you remember the, the Facebook? Whatever happened to that? We have a brilliant developer-friendly UI, as you can tell, with the square brackets and binary numbers in the header. That's essential. Awesome, awesome developer UX. But also in 2004, Java added generics. So, what, so let's go back and just recap why generics were added to Java to begin with. Um, here we've got some great Java, some vintage Java 2004 era. Um, and remember, there's no for each loop before there either. And if we just uh, run this code, we'll see it works perfectly, and we can just ship it, right? Oh, hang on. There's a pretty large cast, class cast exception there. So what's, what's going on here, Raoul? Why is this blown up in our face? Well, it looks like you're adding uh, two, two strings and a number, then you're treating and casting back to, to a string. So obviously, the number is not going to be cast back to a string. So what can we do to add a bit of type safety here, Richard? Generics, right? Generics. That's what we can do. We can add some generics in. We can say, this is a list that only contains strings. And as Java went on, uh, we could also use the diamond operator introduced in Java 7 to say, instantiate this array list and infer the generic parameter from its target type. That's pretty good, right? Yeah, that's pretty good. So from a runtime error, we've moved to a compile time error. So that's pretty good. Fantastic. So now it blows up at compile time and solves a runtime error. Perfect. Um, but, but Richard, you know, I, I could do that before Java generics anyway, right? I could create an extra class called list string and another class called list integer, and I don't have to add this whole complexity here in the language. Well, what's wrong with that, Richard? What's wrong with that? Well, the problem is that we might not just want to have a list of strings. We might want to have a list of integers. We might want to have a list of our person classes, favorite tutorial example, any old other class that we want. So it doesn't really scale up to a large code base. But you know, um, the, the C sharp pre-generics collections API does have a string list, doesn't it, for this exact reason. So this kind of brings us to a, a more interesting kind of trilemma that you might engage with this kind of thing. On the one hand, we've got simplicity. So you know, not having to worry about this complicated set of rules that generics brings to us. On the bottom left-hand corner, we've got static safety. So by static safety, we mean the ability to take 
runtime errors that will blow up in your face at 5 to 5 on a Friday afternoon and stop you from going to the pub, and convert them into compile time errors, which you can just say, ah, this code is broken. I'm going home for the weekend. It's fine anyway. In the bottom right-hand corner, we've got concision. And we don't mean concision. We're not saying Java's necessarily the most concise language across all respects. But what we mean here is not having to copy boilerplate template code all over the place to achieve this kind of type safety. So we've got languages like you know, Java, Scala, C Sharp, C++, which are statically typed and have some kind of generics or equivalent feature sitting here with both static safety and concision. And they give up simplicity to achieve that. We've got languages on the dynamically type spectrum, like JavaScript, Ruby, Python, which have got simplicity and concision, but throw away static safety. And on the other thing, we have, like, say, the string list approach, or perhaps even languages which have some generic types, but don't allow arbitrary runtime types to be generic, like uh, Phantom, for example. And they achieve simplicity and static safety, but if you actually want to do it in the general case, you need to copy and paste loads of code around. We kind of bring this up because when we're talking about generics, there's always a lot of complexity and downsides involved. We always need to remember there's this big trade-off. Nothing's a free lunch. It's all, all a big trade-off. It's interesting to see, actually, all those languages, like JavaScript, Ruby, and Python, there's a lot of work that's been done to actually add static type checking to those languages. You'll see lots of type annotation proposal. So it looks like the ecosystem is sort of migrating down this bottom left corner of the diagram as well. Fantastic. So that was 2004. This, isn't, this is 2015. So what are the things that we can do with generics today that are available in the language that maybe we don't really see people doing that much, but which might have some benefit for them? What do you think, Raul? Well, so we're going to review three, three patterns that we've seen in, uh, in, in Java code bases, which hopefully you, you'll, you'll find interesting. So the first one are intersection types. So there's a feature in Java called intersection types, and we'll look at that. Then we'll talk about the curiously recurring uh, generics pattern. So very useful pattern to bring up in a, you know, a dinner to look smart. Really recommend it. Uh, what does it mean? No one knows. I don't know. Yeah, so we'll, knows? we'll talk about it. And then wildcards, probably everyone's favorite feature in Java. All those question marks. We all love it. Fantastic. <laughs> I'll take that. Yes. yes. We all love it. <laughs> So let's start off with intersection types. And intersection types is really an idea that you know, comes back to primary school. So does everyone remember those really cool and sexy Venn diagrams? You know, Who loves a good Venn diagram? I love a good Venn diagram. Yes. So the Venn diagram is saying, essentially, given two, 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 two areas, we've got a region in the middle that's going to be the intersection. And it turns out we have a similar idea in, in Java. That works as follows. So let's say uh, in the first example here, what we want to declare is a, a type parameter called T, and say that it's going to be a subtype of, of A. Okay, So it's bounded by A. When we say a subtype, what we mean here is if A is an interface, it implements it. And if it's a class, it extends it. Nice and simple. Precisely. And within section types, what we can do is to say that actually T can be a subtype, has to be a subtype of both A and B. OK, so we do that using this sort of ampersand operator. And that's an intersection type. So is that a useful feature? Well, let's look at a, at a code example. So let me just comment this out so we don't have um, compare. So we're going to look at a, an example here, which is sort of a serialization, deserialization use case. So we've got some, uh, some person objects. Uh, here we go. So person is, has a name and has an, has an age. Okay. So what we're going to do here is to read off some data from a, a data input stream and deserialize it into a person object and print, print, print the output. So let's just run this code so we see what happens. Fantastic. Don Drapper, age 89. Who's a fan of Madman? A few people. If you're not putting your hands up, go watch Madman. It's a great TV show. But yeah, set back in the 60s, if Don was alive today, he'd be a very, very old man. He'd be very happy, I think, to see some yeah. code about him. Yeah. So now, you know, let's say we've got this read method here, which is the, the meat, right? So that's taking the data input stream, takes the source, is going to read off the name of the person and the age of the person, create a person object around it, OK? And of course, we sort of, we've got this try and catch block here in the case that we've got an IO exception. 
But Richard, software, the software industry always changes, isn't it? Yep, new requirements come in, or perhaps a new change of some internal structure. Suppose we want to you know, use a different input source, like a random access file here, rather than a data input stream. So what are we going to do? Here's the code that used the random access file. And unfortunately, this code here now is not compiling. So if I mouse over this error here from TJ, it tells me, well, our method read that we created expected data input stream, but we're given a random access file. So that's problematic. We've got a type checking errors here. So what we can do, so, you know, classic software development technique, you know, if we get paid by um, lines of code, yep. as we yep. always do. Raul you know. has just doubled his income here. This is there fantastic. Compile, ship it, isn't it? Yes, compile, ship it. Great. But I heard, I heard someone saying that having huge blocks of duplicate code that does basically the same thing is perhaps not a great, the greatest of ideas around your program. Yeah, so who, who came up with that rule? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, OK. So let's see if we can do something better. So obviously, we had those two methods that were exactly doing the same, but they were just expecting different types. So what we're going to try and do here is to find this error in the middle. If you remember this Venn diagram, what we want to find is what's in common between the data input stream and the random access file. Maybe we can use that as a common functionality. So obviously, you know, we need to be able to, to read information because there is the method read utf and read int. And we need to be able also to, to close this resource. It's within a try catch here. Um, block, which is auto-closable. So what we're going to do is just dig a little bit into the definition of this class, data input stream. It implements data input. Fantastic. So that's the interface that provides us those read operations. Also extend this class here, filter input stream, which extends input stream, which eventually also implements an interface called closable. All right. That's fantastic. So let's do the same exercise with random access file. So if I look at random access file, we can see that actually it's also implementing data input. It's also implementing closable. So those are the two interfaces that those two classes have in common. So Raul, I've got an idea. We've got two interfaces. Let's have a new interface that extends both of them. How about that? Yeah, let's just do that. So we're going to say extends data input and closable. Right? So this is the sort of type that we like to create. And we'd like to be able to replace this within a um, a method here, right? So if I take this piece of code, paste it around here. That's, you know, we would like to do something like that because the, this interface here represents something that's data input and closable, which is exactly what random access file and data input stream are implementing. But this doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because obviously this interface here is not being implemented by those two classes. We need to retrofit this interface onto existing JDK classes. And unfortunately, we're not Stuart. Stuart in the room here has the master keys. We, <laughs> we, we don't have those master keys. <laughs> so we're going to have to come up with a different trick. And the trick is to make use of uh, intersection types. So intersection types are useful in such a situation where you want to create a dummy type where you can provide a subtype for several um, interface or classes. So what we're going to do here, say we're going to have a type parameter called i that's going to extend both a data input and closable. Fantastic. So we declare this in front of the return type here. We're going to use this new dummy type that we created as the input to read and make sure to replace it into the block of the method read. And fantastic. Seems like it's compiling, Richard. Yeah, let's ship it. Ship it. Let's see. Fantastic, fantastic. Wow, it actually worked. It works. My goodness, that static safety might be useful. Um, so we're not necessarily saying you want to throw these intersection types around the code base. Obviously, you can see there's a bit of a readability hit. But, and you may well not have had a situation where, hey, you actually want something that implements both data input and closable interface. But you might well have had a situation sometime in your career where you're like, there's just this missing interface. And it's not there, and it would be really, really useful if it existed. And this is possibly a tool which you can use to address that kind of problem. So that's nice. Precisely. But Richard, there's other use cases for using intersection types. And the other one is this one. What have you done to your door, Raoul? How, how are you going to close that? It's not my door. It's actually Stuart's door over there. 
I'm picking on Stuart at the moment. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, what is going on with this code? What the hell? So, you know, we've got something that's an object and comparable, but comparable object should be an object, right? Which is, what, this is a bit strange. Let's break it down step by step, shall we? Let, let's do this. So, you may recognize the intersection type, right? This ampersand symbol, hey? So we've got something that's in intersection type of both object and comparable. And that's a signature that we've taken right from the uh, collections API, okay? So why have we got this extra object? Well, to really understand this, we need to sort of uh, take a step back and go back in the past. And before generics were introduced, this is a signature that we would find for the max method. It would take a collection, so no generics here, and would return you an element in that collection. Therefore, an object, right, which is within this collection. This object would be the maximum. And once you've come up with a signature for an API, that's a signature that you stuck forever to preserve binary compatibility. And arguably here, we could say that actually max really should be returning something that's comparable, because if the elements in the collections are not comparable, how can we actually find the maximum, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. So we could argue that actually the signature for this max method should return comparable. And that's something that, you know, we wanted to fix when, when I say we, I mean the library designers. People with the keys. With the keys. Wanted to fix. So when generics were introduced, we ideally would like to say something like that, right? All the elements in this collection, so that's the, the T that you see here, have to be comparable. And don't worry about those extra question marks. We'll cover that uh, later. But we, which means, hey, actually, the signature that would be compiled by the Java compiler is as follows, something that returns a comparable. That's because generics are erased. And the strategy was used to, pre to have a sort of migration path between non-generic code and generic code so they can interrupt. The problem we've got here is actually the generated signature for Max is different to the one we had in the past, right? In the past, it was returning an object. Now we're returning something that's comparable. So we've got a binary incompatibility. And binary incompatibilities are very bad. No one likes them. No one likes them. Especially the Scala folks, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> little poke. <laughs> <laughs> so the trick that you know, the language designers came with is by adding this uh, extra, extra bound. So by saying that actually the signature of Max here is the elements inside Max, some are both object and comparable, what the Java compiler will do is pick up the left hand side of this intersection here object and use that to produce the signature for this method. And by using that, we preserve binary compatibility. So that's the story behind this sort of crazy signature. It has to do with binary compatibility, which is a good thing for us, right? So we want to have compatibility, but we're paying the price a little bit from a complexity point of view. Ah, here's an even more fantastic example. So Java 8 added Lambda expressions. Woohoo! Come on, woohoo! Um, <laughs> great. Um, and we've got a situation where certain types of Lambda expressions uh, you might want to have them have give them the ability to be serialized, right? But at the same time, you need to tell the compiler, here's a target type for your Lambda expression, here's some functional interface which the compiler will say, hey, right, that's the target type for the Lambda expression, that's the type I'm going to use. And you might not want to make every instance of that functional interface serializable. You might not want to say every comparator is serializable for the more serializability. The comparator has been around for a while, so you can't just retrofit and say it extends another interface willy-nilly. Now, here's an example method where you do want to have something that's both a comparator and serializable. So the intersection type is used in the return position here, and the Lambda expression gets casted to that intersection type. And that's basically telling the compiler, look, go generate me something that's both a comparator and serializable. So this is a possible... Uh, pattern that you can use if you want to make a serializable lambda that's an instance of a non-serializable functional interface. And so that's quite cool. The compiler is happy here because in this context, there's always only one single abstract method provided by the comparator interface. Serializable is just a flag interface. So technically, you could have any amount of interfaces as long as they also flag interfaces. Whether that's useful, we don't think so. But serializable is a good use case for, for this intersection type. Fantastic. So Richard, 
What's your, what's your door doing on this slide? <sighs> Is that really my door? I, I swear it didn't, it didn't look like that originally. Oh, well. We've all seen this kind of thing at the top, right? This, this class, enum of E extends enum of E. What's going on here? If you're uh, an academic, you might call this uh, F-bounded polymorphism. But as we all know, there's an internet meme that much more accurately describes the situation going on here. Yo, dog, I put a type parameter in your type parameter so you could... Wait, wh wh why are we actually doing this again? What? <laughs> Fantastic. Let's see some code. Let's, let's have a look into a bit of a code example and see what's going on. So um, we've got uh, a little method here. And we've got two very confused people. And one of the confused people is called John, and the other confused pe person is called Bob. Uh, and John is confused uh, because if we uncomment this line of code here, where we try and clone John and put him, reassign it to himself, we try and make a clone of him. There's a compile error. Hmm, that's a bit weird. Let's look at the declaration of confused person one in details. Let's see what's going on yeah, in there. Yeah, fantastic. So it's implementing clonable of string, which is surely that should be picked up as a compile error, right? Yeah, maybe it should be. Maybe it should be picked up as a compile error. So we can take that clonable of string and just make the make it clonable of confused person one to begin with. And that'll be nice. And then we need to update the clone method and make it return confused person one and instantiate a new confused person one. Now well, that's cool. And if we look back to our main method, that compile error goes away. That's exactly what we'd expect. But it still feels like that should have been a compile error for confused person one to extend clonable of string to begin with. That's right, yeah. Let's have a look at confused person two, Bob. Now, Bob, we take a clone of Bob, and we clone that clone again. It's like a very bad Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. <laughs> but unfortunately, just like a very bad Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, you can't do any kind of abstraction or generalization of lessons learned. So if we try and clone this confused person and clone them again, that's something which we should just be able to do on anything that implements our clonable interface. If you can clone something, then that thing should in and of itself be clonable. That's a reasonable thing that you might want to express. So how can we change that in our clonable interface? Well, at the moment, we'll see that our clonable interface just takes a type parameter t and has no restriction or control over what that t is, right? So that meant that we could have confused person of one implementing clonable of string. It made no sense, but the type system allowed us to do it. Whereas if we say clonable of t extends clonable of t, that's lovely. That would A, stop that earlier compile error with confused person one, and B, we can now clone our clone. Fantastic. All the Arnold Schwarzeneggers are happy at this point in time. Cool. But what else is there? What else is there that we could talk about when it comes to generics, Raoul? Well, so you, you introduced that question mark in the clonable. Mm. So we're going to talk about this question mark, and they're called wildcards. So we really believe there must be a reason why the language designer chose a question mark for this feature. Maybe by so confusing and puzzling it is. A level of foresight, amazing. So, wildcards, what are wildcards all about, Raoul? Well, here's some example of wildcards that you may see already in the, in the Java API. So, question mark extends t, lovely, lovely, that seems reasonable. Then we've got a compatible question mark super t. Already that feels a little bit weirder, and we're gonna talk about this. But then there's this other guy here, Burn Research, so you can have a question mark itself compatible, that itself is a question mark super t. Just, just lovely to nest those things together. So we're going to try and shed some light on what this stuff is about. But the sort of the key, the key summary is that it's all about subtyping. It's all about getting flexible APIs. And that's what we're going to try and demonstrate. So Richard, what are we going to, um, what's going to be the domain for, for this sort of a little exercise that we're going to right. do? Well, let's, let's, let's send some messages around. Um, well, for the moment, we'll just be printing them out on the console just so you can see what's going on. 
All right, so um, we'll have a couple of different types of messages. We can send emails and text messages. How about that? So a couple of different subclasses of the message class. Fantastic. Nice and simple. So turns out we've got a log a log message a log method here. So let's just log a new uh, email message. I'm going to say hello DevOx. Fantastic. Cool. This has got to be the most advanced log system ever. All right. Well, Hi, DevOx. yeah, don't troll. This is still uh, more efficient than log4j. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, back to the point in hand. We didn't need to say anything. Our log method just took a message, and we could pass an email message in as a parameter. We could pass a text message in as a parameter. Nice and familiar. I'm sure everyone does this every day on a day-to-day -day basis. And so what about if we go a little step further than that. We've erased. So email messages was possible because email message is a subtype of message. It's extending it, so we can substitute them. That's great. Um, let's see if we create an array of uh, emails. Uh, emails array. There you go. Just going to create one simple email message. We love beer. So it's almost 5 o'clock, so it's beer time, isn't it? Yeah. So we've got another me another method here called log all that's going to take a an array of uh, of messages. So let's see what happens if we actually pass this. Ah, that seems to be working. So let's compiles. Let's see if it runs. What happens? Let's let's see if it runs. Ship it. All right. So that's cool. working as well. So it looks like actually an email message array is also a subtype of a message array. So we've a little bit we've extended that relationship we had between an email message and a message. So just normal subtyping, we sort of lifted that now to an array of email messages and an array of messages. So that's pretty good. That means you know API is quite flexible. We could pass also an array of text messages. That's brilliant. Is there a name I can use for this if I want to impress people with my my knowledge of types? Not something you do on a regular basis. But what would you say, Raoul? What can you do there? What's it called? It's called covariant arrays. That's the that's the technical impressive word. So if you see yourself in such a situation where you've got subtyping that is lifted to something more than just regular types, we'll call it covariance. That's the sort of word that that, that you'll often hear. Um, but you know, since we've been able here to um, to use this subtyping principle by passing it as an argument to the logo message, we means we can do some uh, some more interesting things. So I'm going to create an array of messages now, as yep. opposed to email messages. Uh, messages array. And I'm just going to assign it the, the array of emails, because we still get the subtyping relationship. right? So instead of passing as an argument, I'm just assigning it. So Works. That's all consistent. Makes perfect sense. But hang on a minute, Raul. If you've got an array of messages here, this message array, does that mean you can put a text message into that slot? Is no. that possible? Why not? Because the elements in that array are, are just of type message. Text message is a subtype of message. So Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. So let's create a text message saying, uh, you guys are awesome. Oh, there we go. Seems to be compiling, Richard. So let's just ship it again. Yeah, you know, if it compile compiles, ship. It, it'll, it'll definitely work. Fantastic, fantastic. What have we got mm. going on here? So you had an array store exception, right? At line 34. So that's exactly at the assignment level. So mm, that's very interesting because you know this array that we've created here and the elements of the array living on the heap, on the heap, are email message elements, right? But using this assignment here, we get a different view to this array. We're saying, actually, the elements are just message, which means we can assign some elements inside the array. But the array is email messages, and we're inserting text messages. So obviously, that's completely wrong, right? In Java, we really believe in static uh, type safety, and suddenly we've got a runtime error. So that's problematic. But to give a bit of credit to the you know, language designers, actually, if you remember the dark days before generics. Vintage Java. Vintage Java. How would you write a method you know, that takes an array and needs to find an element inside that array? 
right? And you may want to pass an array of, uh, of strings, an array of integers, an array of, of Richard, you know. So this property here lets us create a sort of flexible APIs that can take arrays of different types. So that was necessary back in the days. But now we've got generic Richard, so got collections as well. We can use a list. Who wants arrays anyway? Let's get rid of those pesky arrays. Yes. So let's put a list in, see what happens now. Right, so we've got another method here called log all that's overloaded to take the list. So we've got a bunch of lists defined here. So let's pass uh, messages. Okay. So pass a list of message because the method log all here expects a list of message. So that's, that's good. Let's, let's ship it. So far, so good. Cool, cool. But if we can do this with a list of messages, can we do this with lists of email messages? It's a bit like dodgeball, isn't it? If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. That's what we're talking about here. Can we, we can pass a list to print out a list of messages. Can we print out a list of email messages? Well, let's give it a shot. So I've got a, a, a list of email message here. We'll just pass this in. And unfortunately, we get a, a compile error, which says, actually, uh, I don't have such a method here, um, so we stuffed. And <laughs> <laughs> it kind of makes sense, though, doesn't it? I mean, we said that doing the, the this, this covariance thing with arrays led to bad consequences. So we wouldn't want to allow people to do it for lists as well. But perhaps we can think of something that lets us use it in a way that's safe without bearing the downsides and, and saying we have to use it everywhere. Precisely. So what we'd like to do here. Um, is to use this subtyping relationship that we have between an email message and a message, but have it also between a list of email message and a list of message, but in a safe way. So by default, we'll say that generics are invariant, so this relationship doesn't exist. What we're going to try and do now is to get this covariant relationship, which we mentioned earlier. And you can do this using this feature called uh, wild counts, and you can say question mark, extends message. So you're saying ahead, actually, I will accept any list where the elements are a subtype of message. Okay, so message defines the sort of the abound. Okay, and what this type is going to do is make sure that you can't actually use um, this new message list here and add elements of a different type. The compiler provides some fences, so you can't do that just because it's a different type. So if we run this code now, fantastic. fantastic. We printed out our list of email messages. Glorious. So that's nice. But um, suppose you wanted to add some kind of back end to this sophisticated enterprise scale logging system that we've got. Um, and maybe we'd say you want to add in a different way of printing things out. So maybe something that prints out just the message on its own or prints things out generally. How would we do that, Raoul? So Richard, I've got the exact interface, the right interface for you for this, introduced in Java 8. Uh, anyone using Java 8 today? Yes, more and more people. Come to the dark side of the force. Um, so consumer is the interface that we really need because it defines something that takes an element and it's going to do something with it. So it consumes those elements. So in terms of logging with different mechanisms, that's the sort of interface that we like to use. Yeah. So we'll say it takes a consumer of message, you know, and put a class, and we can replace this stuff here now to actually um, accept a given message. Okay? So we've got different behaviors that we can inject here through a consumer to say how we'd like to, to log the messages in the list. And we've made that code more flexible. Well, so we need to fix this one here because that's um, not compiling anymore because this method expects two arguments. Yep. So um, just to make it more explicit, we're going to say, uh, let's take a consumer here. It's going to take a, a message and it's just going to print the, the message. And that's Lambda expressions, if you're not familiar with it. Great feature introduced uh, in Java 8. So let's me... Uh, define a consumer here in a very concise way. Now I can pass this consumer as an argument to log all. Let's see what happens. Cool, so it's just printed out the message. It's done exactly what we expected it to do.
Hmm. But, but Raul, I've got a bit of a question for you here. Do I need to create a new consumer of message all over the place? Do I need to? Couldn't I just put like a consumer of object, right? Because if you know how to print out an object, you know how to print out a message, because a message is a type of object. How, how do we do that? Can we just say consumer of object? What's going on? OK, Richard. So I think you're saying you want, you know, let's say we've got a consumer of object, and we're just going to call it print. And let's just use, uh, just for the sake of this example, we'll just use the print method. So this is a method reference. Takes consumer objects, so the elements are objects, and we're just going to print them out. What we like to do is to say, well, actually, we've got a, a consumer here that is you know, less specific, works with any kinds of object, and we'd just like to be able to use this consumer head to print the email messages. Unfortunately, if we do this, we get this error here that says, actually, I'm expecting a, a consumer of message, and you're giving me a consumer of object. Okay. Come on, Java. It should just work, damn it. It should just work. It what can we do? Just work, what can yeah. we do to solve this problem? Well, introducing the the little brother, little sister of the question mark extends called question mark uh, super. What question mark super is going to say is I'm actually accepting any super type of message, including message itself. So if you will, previously we had the subtyping from this direction by saying a list of email message is a subtype of a list of message. Now we've got subtyping from a different direction. We're saying that actually a consumer of object is a subtype of a consumer of message. That's why we can pass it as an argument. And our code is compiling here, so let's just, let's just run it. And cool. we get hello by email. So those wildcards here, the, the, the bottom line is, you know, it's all about subtyping. It's all about creating those flexible APIs that can abstract the types that we're working with. And that's what wildcards lets you do. You get subtyping for generics, but in a type safe way. Fantastic. So that covers subtyping. And the question mark super here is, you know, um, the one that is a little bit more scary, but it's really commonly used for functional interfaces that were used, that were introduced in Java 8. So for example, predicate here really means a, a function that takes some element and returns a Boolean. So you can see that the type parameter T here with capital T is used as an argument to the test method. So that means this predicate interface here can only be used with the question mark super. By default, it should be question mark super. And you'll often hear academics talking about contravariance. That's the sort of the, the dual for covariance. Contravariance is a technical word. And comparator is another example here. You can see that T appears as uh, the types of the arguments of this method. So that means this interface can only be used contravariantly. By default, it should be the case. So you can get the flexibility. But this is really exciting as well. Things like question mark extends and question mark super weren't really used that much before, were they really? But the, ex the introduction of lambda expressions means we've got a load of situations where things like question mark super is naturally very useful all over the place. Precisely. And it's always useful to, you know, language features is a really interesting topic. Uh, you know, how do we make use of them? Where do we make use of them? Are they useful? How can we improve on them? And there's a lot of research that actually looks at empirical analysis of those features. And uh, you know, the, the, the Java LangTools team is making use of those techniques to make sure that you know, we've got relevant um, updates in the language. And there's a paper here by Chris Ponin and et al, which actually looked at millions and millions of lines of code of, uh, of Java code. And what they found was actually quite fa fairly interesting, but not so surprising. It's actually 90% of generic users were just for collections. So list of string, array list of string, hash map string to string, and set string, you know, covers 90% of generic users. So this is a really is interesting crazy. story as well, isn't it? We've got all these features. They have some valuable use cases, perhaps some getting even more common. But actually, we don't use those features very often. Well, Should we? So there is a different side to the story. It sounds like actually there's features that are very useful from a, from a user point of view on the applications we write. And then there's a whole bunch of other complex features which gets you flexibility, but leave more on the library design point of view, right? That should be living there, so they're shielded away from, from us users. And that is sort of things that we, we're going to talk about as well. So that covers the present, and we're going to now jump Jump in the future. So back Fantastic. to the future. It's the year. What we're going to talk about here 
comes with a very fancy Oracle legal slide saying, don't believe us. We don't actually know what's going to happen with the future, but we've been looking at the mailing list and talking with the team to quite get an idea of what's going on. Yeah, yeah. But um, instead of having some legalese, here's a back to the future picture. Fantastic. Much, much prettier. <laughs> cool. So the first thing that we, we talked about is the idea of use site variants. So that's the wild cards that you've seen so far. And we call them use site variants because they give you subtyping flexibility. But you have to opt in as a user to actually make use of that. So in your code, you're going to have to say question mark extends message if you want to be able to pass a list of email messages. So use site variants because as a user, you have to decide to make use of that feature if you want flexibility. Same thing for the consumer here. You need to explicitly say question mark super message if you want to get the flexibility. And this, this kind of sucks, right? Because it means that every single one of us all the time needs to use these features in our code to obtain that flexibility. But couldn't we push this into those people who maintain libraries? It, it, it doesn't really sound like they've got enough work to do. Maybe we can push <laughs> some burden on, onto their shoulders. I think they, they do have a lot of work going on with uh, <laughs> value types, which we'll talk about in, in a sec. But the general idea here is um, declaration site variants. So that's, as Richard is saying, is why don't we take this complexity living on the application code, li living with the users, and push it down at the library level so we don't have to worry about it. So here's how it could look like using some uh, not made up syntax. This actually could be a possible syntax. But what we're saying here is that consumer takes the type parameter t, and this parameter t needs to be used contravariantly with question mark super as a default annotation. So that means anywhere we see consumer, for example, consumer of message, by default, we could pass a consumer of object. We get that flexibility because the subtyping, the variance annotation is pushed at the library level. And we could do something similar with iterator. So iterator is only producing elements, so the type parameter appears in a return position. So that can only be used covariantly. So using this annotation here, it means anyone here could pass an iterator of an email message, for example. But as a user, you don't have these verbose annotations cluttering your code anymore. So declaration site variance is the feature that does that. And it's a feature that is used in other programming languages, like C Sharp and Scala have adopted uh, this feature. Actually, Java is, you know, now it's owned, there's other academic languages using use set variants, but it's one of the only mainstream programming language that actually use uh, use set variants. But that means the flexibility is pushed on at, for the users, and you get verbosity through, due to the annotations. But it's really powerful. You could have a time that is both covariant and contravariant if you really want to. In practice, that's not really the case, so it's not really necessary. Um, declaration side variants, though, is the alternative, where you push that verbosity down at the library level, the complexity is pushed down there, you still get flexibility. But in certain situations, you might have to split up your type hierarchy. For example, a list. You can both write a list, you can add elements to the list. So the type parameter here appears in a contravariant position, right, as an argument. But you can also get element from a list. So the type parameter appears as a written type. So if you want to have declaration side variance here, it's a bit complicated. You need to split the users in terms of read and write. So it comes with a bit of additional complexity from a design point of view, but that's OK. It's for the designers. And it turns out this is a feature that is ex being explored for, for Java uh, as part of a Java enhancement proposal. So here's the link for those of you who are interested uh, in this. Uh, it's currently being proposed for JDK 10. Uh, so that's not something to expect in the near future. But again, there's research that shows actually this is really useful. So there's a paper here that was published at PLDI, so a very good academic conference. And what it shows actually, by looking at library code, 27% of generic classes and 53% of generic interfaces could be having a default variant annotation. Something like consumer and comparator and iterator. They could just have a default parameter. We wouldn't have to always type those question marks in our user code, right? So that's pretty massive, actually. That's actually showing that actually declaration side variants would have a beneficial impact on, on Java code. And not only that, but existing code making use of wildcards 
39% of those users could be totally inferred with declaration side variants. So a whole bunch of verbosity could be cleaned up uh, using this feature. And as Richard was mentioning, with Java 8 and functional interfaces, that's something that's becoming uh, even more useful. Another thing that we might need to think about in terms of upcoming Java features that also interacts with generics is the proposed addition of value types, which has been mooted for you know, a Java 10 type schedule. Who knows? Um, and the mantra with value types here is it codes like a class but works like an int. So what does that mean? Well, classes and kind of objects inherently have certain forms of identity. We can talk about having you know, a value-like identity where we, we, we've got an equals method and we can say two things are equal, where, where their fields are equal, where they're trying to represent the same value. Or we can also say that they have reference-like identity. We've got that double equals. And what we're saying is that's pointing to the actual same object in memory. And suppose we were to uh, imagine that we only had types that had value-like equality. So no concept of identity. It's just a bag of values, just a struct of values, if you're familiar with C. What does that mean? Well, firstly, it means there's a potential compactness win. So um, objects have headers. Headers eat some kind of memory. Uh, they've got information associated there with locks. They've got information there associated with threads that that lock could be biased to. They've got a pointer to the class that owns them. All sorts of things. Now, potentially, there's, there's the opportunity to remove the uh, header information that objects have. Now, depending upon which JVM version, we're using 32 or 64 bit architectures, whether you've got compressed oops switched on or off, you could be saving 8 to 16 bytes. Now, it doesn't sound very much, but if you're talking about an int versus an integer, that's quite a lot of memory. Because you also have to take account of uh, alignment rules on a 64-bit JVM without compressed oops switched on. A boxed integer is taking up 24 bytes of memory, a primitive int only four. So that's a six times blow up in terms of memory there. But much, much more importantly is improved sequential locality, flatness in memory. So one of the ongoing hardware trends that we've had is CPUs getting faster, right? That's fantastic. But transistor counts, uh, which is what Moore's Law is originally de defined in terms of, do continue to double. We've got multi-core machines. We, we have got some performance improvements, even though you need to go parallel to use those advantages. But memory, on the other hand, has been speeding up at a much, much, much slower rate, only 9% per year over the last decade. And what that means is there's been increasingly large gap opening up year on year on year for ages between getting data out of your main memory and actually doing compute work. If you look at computationally bounded tasks these days, they're often much more bound by how fast you can get data out of memory. Now, I know what you're saying. It's OK, you've got a CPU cache. It'll prefetch data. It'll pull it into memory. It'll, it'll pull it into a, an on-die cache. That's much faster, fantastic stuff. But in order to be able to prefetch that data into the CPU and not have your CPU sitting there stalled, waiting on data from main memory, it needs to predict where in memory those objects are. So just think about an array of objects in Java, kind of this, this, this guy we've got on the right, just an array of our user objects. We've got an array of what's really under the hood pointers pointing to a heap allocated user object, which is at some arbitrary location heap which is pointing to, say, some ID and then a name at other arbitrary locations in heap. That's a heck of a lot of pointer indirection. Your CPU's cache prefetcher can't predict that random offset to somewhere else in main memory. But if what we say is we'll lay them out sequentially in memory, then as we iterate over that array, we can nicely stream the data out of memory, makes our cache prefetcher's job a lot nicer, makes our code run a lot faster. So there's a huge potential benefit there. But in the context of generics, there's yet more complexity. Because we said generics were originally implemented through erasure, at runtime, you don't have necessarily the information to say, hey, lay out an array like this, lay out an array like this. So in order to have a generic type that lets you have a value type as a parameter, like you know an array list that's taking a value type as a parameter, you need to think about generics a little bit more differently. You need to be able to say to the compiler, look, 
you can put a value type here, and it's okay to use it. You need to be able to give it some guarantees. You're never going to use that reference equality, because reference equality doesn't make any sense. You're never going to call synchronized on an instance of that generic type, because you've got no uh, uh, object header, you've got, you've, got nothing to, you've got no monitor to lock on. You're never going to use the condition variables, wait or notify. And that contracts to the compiler is, uh, may, may not be this syntax, maybe the syntax, but there needs to be some kind of notion introduced of saying, this is any type. It could be a reference type, it could be a value type. We're going to commit to not using those features which are reference type only. So there is a little bit more generics complexity cropping in. But on the upside, this also means we can do something which people have been clamoring to do for ages and ages and ages, which is do primitive specialization. So you have a list of int, and that's genuinely a list of primitive int that's genuinely backed by a primitive int array under the hood. Um, and in fact, if you uh, look at the, the, the Valhalla prototype, the primitive specialization case, even though it's kind of quite prototype implementation, there's already work on there already, and you can already use the primitive specialization examples already. You can try NFIing your collection code, and if you do that, It'll work. So if you want to explore this kind of stuff more, there's a prototype on the Valhalla project for specialization. Also includes the value types and the value type generic changes. Uh, I mean, they're far from complete, but it's a good prototype to play around with. And there's also this state of the specialization document if you want to kind of learn more and go into more details about things. There's, look, there's a mailing list uh, as well, right? the Valhalla mailing list. Uh, the team is looking for feedback on how this is being used in practice, so do, do contribute to it if you've got time. Fantastic. So we've also put a quick slide with some references up here, all the source codes available on GitHub. And if you're interested in more kind of other, slightly more exotic uh, language generic features, there's a bit of a list there that you can go and have a look at. But um, let's conclude first, Raoul. Yeah, so I mean, this is quite interesting. So generics, you know, a feature introduced in 2004, and over time, actually, more and more libraries have been making use of generics. So it's a feature that is here to stay. If you look at the whole collector's implementation in Java 8, you'll see generics all over the place, because it lets us write code that is really expressive from a user point of view. But on the library point of view, we need those sort of complex feature. Uh, so generics users has increased uh, in scale and complexity. Uh, that's something that we'll see in the future as well with value types and the combination of generics with value type, as Richard is saying. So it's going to become more and more complex. Um, but it's a good idea that this feature actually, most of the burden is pushed down to library designers. And that could be done as well with declaration side values that we mentioned earlier. So for us user, hopefully it should be all good and most of the complexity will be pushed down for library designers. But, you know, the overall conclusion here is that static type safety, something we all love in Java, we get those compile errors, which tell us we've got to fix things before we ship our programs. It's always a trade-off between simplicity and flexibility. If we want to get more flexibility, that means the type system, the feature are becoming more complex. And that seems to be the general trend where things are heading. Um, so before we take uh, questions uh, for, from you guys, just quickly want to mention a few things. So Richard has got a fantastic course on Plural Site. if you want to learn more about generics. So it's a sort of four hours course intensive for, for you to recap on those things. Um, I run the Cambridge Coding Academy, which provides uh, workshops for 14 years old plus to learn how to code and create their own games. It's all in Cambridge. We've got summer schools as well. So if you've got kids and want to send them to England over the summer, check this website. Um, we both book authors. Both books are equally good. Equally good. Um, so if you're interested in Java 8, you can check this, out, this stuff out. And finally, uh, we're also running uh, bootcamp courses. So if you're interested in upskilling in Java 8, we've got a two-day intensive course that covers all the features and all the best practices. We're also running uh, boot camps in, in Java that teaches you the sort of best practices for software development and also for C-sharp. So if you're interested in this stuff, check our website, iteratorlearning.com, and come chat to us uh, afterwards as well. So thanks for listening, and uh, we'll take questions.
Hey, front row, perfect. We don't need to shout about mics. Okay, you have all, all this empirical data in the white papers. Yeah? Does, uh, does it have ice how much unchecked suppressed warnings is caused by the, by the generics? <laughs> um, in what percentage of usages people are later and the suppressed warnings? Um, so I don't have the number on top of my head. So the question is, how much are people using uh, the suppressed warnings when it comes to, to general road types? Um, I would encourage you to read the paper by Chris Pond and Al. So that's the first paper that we mentioned on generic usage. Uh, it's called Adoption of Generics. And there is a section that talks about this stuff. Um, so you may want to, to, to read up on it. Yep. Cool. Yeah, fair enough. There's probably a lot of code out there that just doesn't bother. <laughs> it's a with very, it. very legitimate question. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? I can't see. Like, just shout if you've got your hand up or something? Maybe if you've got a question, just come and ask us directly if you want to talk in private, otherwise just shout now. <laughs> and we're doing this because there's the light, so we're completely blinded here. Oh, okay, well, thank you very much. It's been, been great to give the talk. Cool. Pleasure. <laughs>